back when Western scholars were first learning about Buddhism. Some of them went to Asia after reading some of the texts. And all they'd seen in the texts were suffering, 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 impermanence. So they expected the Asian Buddhists to be pretty depressed, but they found that they were actually very happy. And their original conclusion was that Asian Buddhists didn't know their own religion very well. The scholars felt superior because they had been reading the books. They assumed that the, the people in Asia were illiterate. We now know a lot better, though, because after all, when the Buddha talks about suffering, it's not simply to let you stay in suffering. It's to help you find a way out. That's the only reason he talked about the topic. As he said, if you couldn't develop skillful qualities, it wouldn't have been worth as well to, to teach. And if skillful qualities didn't lead to true happiness, it wouldn't have been worth as well to teach. So the teaching is all about happiness. When the Buddha talks about suffering, he talks about impermanence and constancy. He doesn't want to leave you there. He says, these are problems, but there are solutions. And he shows you the solutions. That's what the Four Noble Truths are all about. This is why we're practicing concentration, to get the mind in shape so it can master those solutions. In the full conviction that, as John Fuang says, we find the brightness of life. That was his comment about what he owed to a John Lee. So it's because of a John Lee that he found the brightness of life. It's good to keep this in mind. The funny thing is how the scholars keep going back to the original proposition that Buddhism should be all about suffering and impermanence, and leave it there. I was reading this just this evening about a book that was saying that this is what's really good about the Buddhist tradition is that it's version of reality faces reality, that there is suffering and there is impermanence. And then the author proposes that everything else in the Buddhist tradition should be thrown out. It's giving too many pat answers. It's not leaving you to have your own direct confrontation, confrontation with this reality, as if leaving you without any tools was going to be a service. I ran into the same line of thought a couple weeks back when someone was saying that there are people out there who say that if you approach the present moment with particular ideas about what you're going to find there, then of course it's going to determine what you find. Your agenda is going to shape what you get out of the present moment, as if that were a bad thing. Somehow there's this idea that what we want is just a naked experience of the present, and that in and of itself will be meaningful or whatever of value. But again, if you approach the present moment without any idea what you're going to find there, who knows what you're going to find and whether it's going to be worthwhile or not. The Buddha describes the present moment to help you know these are the problems in the present moment, but these are the solutions. That's why he talks about not simply bare attention or bare awareness. He talks about appropriate attention. You come into the present moment armed with some knowledge about what's the best way to get happiness out of the present moment. It starts with a distinction between skillful and unskillful qualities. The Buddha lists them and helps you figure out how to recognize them so you don't get sucked into the unskillful ones, because that's all too often what happens. We get into a bad mood, we get into an unskillful state of mind, we get into a defilement, and it's going to pull us in its direction. And if we don't have a clear idea of what our direction is or the direction we want, it's very easy just to go along with the flow. But that term, going along with the flow, corresponds to what in the Thai they call yatakam, which is simply whatever your past karma is, you're just going to flow along with that. It tends to flow down. So we do come into the present moment with an agenda. We want to figure out where the problem is and what the solution is. That book I was reading about today was saying that 
the teachings about the Four Noble Truths, dependent core rising, emptiness, these should all be thrown out because the answers they gave are too pat. Well, the answers are good answers. They work. They give you tools for understanding what you're going to find here, how to take it apart. You get yourself into unskillful state of becoming, they tell you, well, this is how becomings are formed. They're formed through fabrication. You can look at fabrication in terms of the five aggregates. You can look at it in terms of the three kinds of fabrication that are talked about in dependent core rising. It helps get you out of that state. You see it not in terms of narratives about who you are in the world that you're confronting, but simply, oh, these are events in the mind. It pulls you out of the narratives and so you learn to look at the workings of your mind, because that's where the problem is. Remember, the Buddha didn't say the problem is suffering out there. The problem is the clinging in the mind. That's something the mind is doing, and you want to see the process. So he gives you these tools. This is where you look for it, for the clinging, in the aggregates, in the different forms of fabrication. First in areas where it's really obvious, when there's greed, aversion, and then in the less obvious areas where there's delusion. But he gives you the tools for taking these things apart and for understanding them and getting beyond them. That's the whole point of this, is we're going beyond just confronting things. We even go beyond the path. There's the passage where the Buddha is talking about how you deal with defilements. You see them in terms of their origination, in other words, what causes them while it's happening. You see them as they pass away. You look for their allure, why you like them. You look for the drawbacks, and then you develop dispassion when you see that the drawbacks far outweigh the allure. And the interesting thing is the Buddha applies that analysis not only to defilements, but also to factors of the path. There's a way he formulates the path in terms of the five faculties. And he says you don't really know the five faculties until you've seen their origination, their passing away, their allure, their drawbacks, and the escape from them, which is dispassion. So even the path is something we're going to be putting aside. That's the brightness of life, when the point where you can put aside the path, where it's delivered you. So we've got these tools that the Buddha's offered us. And even though there may be people who don't want to make use of them, they say, well, I'd rather solve the problem on my own. It's like a doctor who comes. It says, here's the disease, and here are the, here's the medicine, here's the treatment for it. And some people say, no, I'd rather find my own treatment. And the question is, you look at the doctor, he's cured a lot of people in the past. Why bother finding your own treatment? Try his. No, it will involve developing your own ingenuity and your own discernment. At the very least, you don't have to keep on reinventing the Dharma wheel, because all too often the reinvented Dharma wheels aren't even round. They're all crooked and distorted. They don't go anywhere. Or if they do go anywhere, they go down. So remember, the Buddha was a really good doctor. And we have this illness, but we're not just going to sit there and say, here, I'm going to confront this illness on its own terms, on my own, on my own without any help. It's like someone being surrounded by doctors and saying, nope, I do this on my own. And remember, it is the people who are happy in their practice of Buddhism. That's the reason they're happy is because it offers answers. We're all born into this world with problems. We're all born into this world with suffering. And what makes us happy is we find a way out of that, that suffering. This is why all those Buddhists were happy, that the Buddhists that mystified the scholars. It was the scholars who didn't really understand. When the Buddha talks about suffering, it's because he has a cure for it. And that's the good news of the teaching. And 
This is what attracted me to John Fu. He was living out. At that time, it was a very poor area. The monastery was very poor. But he was the first genuinely happy person I'd ever met. And as he explained to me, he said it wasn't that he was born that way. He also struck me as very wise, and he said he wasn't born wise. It was all through the training. It was because of his happiness that I was attracted to study with him. And I've always been glad I did.